Um, it's getting six o'clock, so we'll get uh, rolling here. Maybe I'll turn that down just a little bit. Um, my name's Derek Johnson. I'm an orthopedic surgeon here in Holland at the Bone and Joint Center. Um, a little bit of background, we'll kind of get into kind of the advancements of uh, joint care, uh, total knee and hip replacement, so we have a lot of information to kind of cover. I usually try to get through, there's a lot of information here, I'll try to get in a lot of new slides at the end. Um, so I'm going to try to keep moving through the uh, presentation, because there is uh, information on both hip and knee in here that uh, we'll kind of move through and uh, try to leave as much uh, time at the end for questions. Um, a little bit of background about myself, um, actually I guess I was born in this hospital, this go way back, but uh, grew up in the area, um, born and raised, and uh, actually did undergraduate uh, training in, uh, in Calvin College in Grand Rapids, um, and then uh, went on to do my undergraduate or, or my postgraduate medical training in Iowa, in Des Moines, and then did a lot of my residency training in orthopedic surgery, did a lot, of, fair majority of that in Ohio. Did spend a year out at Cedar sinai in L.A., um, and that's where I got a lot of uh, interest in uh, anterior total hip replacement um, and did, uh, got some taste of that out there for a year. Um, and then um, after residency in orthopedic uh, surgery, I did a fellowship and did some sp subspecialized training in just hip and knee replacement surgery, where um, basically that's all I do. I'm a subspecialist in orthopedic surgery. All I do is hip and knee replacements or revision surgery. I'm not a general orthopedic surgeon. I don't do a lot of hand, shoulder, that type of thing. I, it's basically hip and knee replacements. And I did my fellowship training in Alexandria, Virginia, in the D.C. area for a year. And now I've been here in the Holland area for about three years and uh, taking some of those procedures that are well known to the West Coast and East Coast uh, towards back to the Midwest. But enjoy being back in the area. I never really thought I'd be back here, but uh, here I am. And uh, I've been here for three years, and uh, uh, it's been quite fun. And we'll kind of talk about... Um, all the differences and uh, some of the outcomes of the patient's uh, outcomes since we've been here for three years. So we're going to get into a lot of hip uh, pain and causes. Um, causes most commonly are arthritis of the hip and uh, knee. We'll kind of get into some of that, what to expect uh, joint replacement wise, advances that have come in the last recent years um, with different approaches and the technology that is out there expectations and rehabilitation after hip and knee replacements, um, and then, like I said, advances in the surgical anesthesia approaches and implant materials and uh, rehabilitation after hip and knee replacements. Um, this is quite a few slides, well, we'll kind of motor through these, uh, but uh, all these slides, basically, um, everybody we have, we have the younger pictures and the older pictures, kind of as a theme through all of these, but everyone here has had hip replacement surgery. Um, again, I just kind of show these and going to throw through here. Um, in their younger years there, um, all have had hip replacement surgery. Some of these are interesting. I didn't know a lot of these, but uh, Tom Watson actually here in 08 had the anterior total hip replacement and uh, is still uh, competing quite successfully. Bo Jackson's had both of his hips done multiple times. Okay, there's a lot. I mean, this list just keeps growing. And I don't, I just, this is a small, that was Gable there. And uh, <laughs> Evil Knievel before, I, I kind of joked. That, that's not what happened to him after hip replacement. But um, <laughs> Ben Halen, yeah. So we'll just kind of get going here. Osteoarthritis is kind of the wear and tear. It's uh, the most common reason for hip and knee replacement surgery. Um, you can see that number. That number is ever increasing. 37 million uh, people are affected by uh, osteoarthritis each year. One in seven people, uh, meaning one in fa three families are affected. So this is a very common um, cause for long-term disability. It says the most common there. Second most common reason why people are seen for pain by their primary care physicians. These numbers are ever increasing. Uh, the total joint uh, population is ever increasing as well. Um, Osteoarthritis itself is characterized by pain in that joint, stiffness, um, loss of motion basically, deformity of that extremity of the hip and knee, and also the loss of mobility or motion around that uh, knee. Just simply, uh, a, osteoarthritis, osteo just meaning, um, you know, arthritis meaning joint, um, inflammation of that joint. There's uh, cartilage around that joint that can get inflamed and that can wear over time. 
um, that you can lose, I basically call it or analogize a lot of uh, these two uh, car uh, analogies basically with hip and knee replacements. It's kind of lost your brake pad or your tire tread, um, which is a cartilage or cushion on the end of the bone, and basically that is worn over time with wear and tear. Um, and there's multiple reasons for this, um, and a joint can lose this. Um, a well lubricated joint has full motion and is pain free, but uh, one with osteoarthritis has damage to the cartilage, which there's wear to that, there's inflammation, there's loss of motion, and there's stiffness that can occur because of the pain where you lose your motion after time and obviously pain. Um, like again, most common cause, reasons for it. I get this question quite a bit actually, and there's not really one known specific reason. Um, there's different uh, anatomy changes or deformities that can cause this. Again, kind of like not getting your tires rotated every year. You can get a wear pattern that's um, consistent for several years. And if you're born with a structural deformity of that uh, limb, you can uh, wear uh, more quickly. Um, there's also anatomy reasons, genetic reasons, overuse. Um, and also weight has been shown to uh, cause increased wear as well. Um, these are some of the risk factors. I mean, I mentioned aging as we age, more cycles that we do a year, puts more wear on the joints, the hip and knee, uh, obesity or weight gain. Each pound uh, that you, you know, gain is about four to three to four pounds of pressure that the hip and knee feels. So um, that's additive um, there. So also it's a, a benefit. So if you lose 10 pounds, it's 30, 40 pounds of pressure that the knee or hip lose as well. Inactivity, loss of exercise, um, poor Prior trauma, uh, again, from bony deformity from other fractures um, or congenital uh, deformities uh, that we're born with that are changed over time. Um, some common complaints, getting in and out of a car, getting out of a low chair, off a toilet. Um, these are some things. Loss of range of motion where you're not able to put on your shoe as much, not get that up. To get the shoe on much is a uh, uh, notice. Um, you're not walking as fast as uh, your partners out there or your friends. Um, they're kind of always kind of taking a couple steps ahead of you and you're kind of lagging behind is another one where people kind of see it. Um, how do we diagnose osteoarthritis of the hip and knee? It's very easy actually. It's a simple x-ray um, which is done right in my office. So we have an x-ray machine probably five feet away from the exam rooms and we take an x-ray right in the um, suite there and uh, very easy to make that diagnosis um, based on the physical exam to look at the knee, the deformity, the range of motion, how much it moves, where the pain is, what the quality of pain is, and where you have it, and what times. But uh, an x-ray is a simple way of uh, doing that. Um, anyway, yeah, this is a, I don't know what this one says. Um, a lot of times people like to kind of uh, say not a lot going on, but again, I guess this, the easiest thing is, is it's not like a heart, I, I say this a lot too, it's not like a heart condition in the sense of, you know, somebody could be scared of, I don't know what they're going to say, I, I probably need to have this or that done. Well, um, in my office it's basically an x-ray and a simple conversation to kind of see and find out what's going out and the options and we kind of lay those out, but nothing is something that I say that we have to do something or this needs to be done, this is a complete conversation. Uh, with the patient and myself to kind of kind of formalize a specific unique treatment plan for them individually and they have a, just as much input as I do. I just kind of guide the process and kind of say where we need because basically any kind of procedure or any kind of uh, thing that needs to be done is kind of based off of pain ultimately. Um, you know the history is kind of when the pain bothers you, is it more in the mornings or at night or with walking or activity related? How does it affect your life and the quality of life and you not being able to do the things that you want to be doing? Are you using assisted devices of a cane, walker, those types of things? Um, are other people telling you walk with a limp or noticing different changes? Um, and then expectations of the patient. What are your goals um, with a procedure? Or what are your goals after a procedure or before? Um, are you doing okay? I have lots of people with severe end-stage osteoarthritis medicated with um, simple over-the-counter medicines or injections or those types of things and do quite well. And that's another option for a lot of patients as well. But it's kind of a specific driven. And what are their expectations after the surgery and what are they, their goals and activity levels afterwards? Um, physical exam, a lot of times uh, we look at the hip and knee range of motion because that's an early telltale sign of loss or arthritic hip. Um, I can tell quite a bit without even an x-ray just by looking at uh, or rotating the hip or knee around to kind of see the deformity or the loss of motion in that joint. And a lot of times these are, are because of spurring that can uh, form after cartilage loss is worn, the bone starts to rub. 
Um, and the reason why people have pain from osteoarthritis is because the cartilage has no nerve endings in it. It's a cushion that keeps the bones from rubbing against each other. The nerve endings are in the bone. And when that cartilage or cushion wears out, the bone starts to rub against each other, and that's what causes the pain of arthritis. But then over time, spurs or extra bone formation around the hip and knee joint can form, and that can lead to a loss of range of motion in the hip or knee. Deformity, like I mentioned, can occur um, if you have wear in a certain area or arthritis of the cushion, you can uh, lose or get this kind of bowing effect, you know, where you kind of get bow-legged there a little bit, um, where you can kind of see a space in between the knees. Or you can get more of a knock-kneed appearance, and these are kind of the pictures here, knock-kneed, normal variant and bow-leggedness based on where that wear is formed. This is an x-ray of a knee. This is a thigh bone, shin bone. You can see the space in between that knee on three compartments in the knee, inside, outside, and under this kneecap, which is another view. But you can see how there's this nice, uh, nice space in between the thigh bone and shin bone. That's not air. That's cartilage or cushion that keeps those bones from rubbing against each other. And that's the space that we're talking about. So on this next picture, on an x-ray, you can see how this person's wear in the knee of the three compartments, they're all their wear of the cartilage loss. It's bone on bone on the inside portion of that knee. And this deformity is called varus deformity or, not, or bow-leggedness of, of that prior picture. You can see how their joint is preserved on the outside of the knee and more than likely the, under the kneecap is as well. And there can be different procedures specific to this deformity and not necessary, you know, that we'll get into a little bit later. Again, this is pictures kind of depicting a normal knee, normal cartilage. Here the red is depicting like on that other picture where that cartilage is completely gone. They also have these cartilage rings called meniscus in between the knee uh, visualized here. And this is a knee implant, actually. This is a total knee implant. We can talk about partial knee implants as well. Um, but uh, this is a total knee implant that resurfaces all three of those compartments in the knee, inside, outside, and under this kneecap. Uh, capping the end of the thigh bone with a piece of metal, capping the end of the shin bone with a piece of metal, and then there's this piece of plastic, that's new, the new brake pad or cartilage or cushion, that is the wearing uh, portion within the knee itself after total knee replacement. This is a hip x-ray, uh, the thigh bone, this is the uh, pelvis or uh, acetabulum, this is the cup, this is the ball. The hip sockets or uh, hip joint is completely different than the knee, the knee being a three compartment kind of structure. The hip itself is more of a ball and socket where you have the femoral head uh, rotating within this acetabulum or socket here. This is one with osteoarthritis kind of obliterating that joint space with no uh, space there whatsoever right up and through here. This is a two-dimensional x-ray. However, this wear pattern would be over the whole femoral head here. These are just x-ray findings, cysts, spurs. I get a lot of questions on radiology reports on patients that have x-rays, and they say, oh, I have a bone cyst or a bone spur or this or that. Those are all just x-ray findings of arthritis within the hip or knee itself. Again, this is just a picture depicting a normal hip, one that's eroded of the cartilage here. And this is one where we make a bone cut here, remove this portion of the ball, put a stem down here, um, and then put a cup in the, the, the pelvis portion of it, piece of plastic and a, uh, in my practice, a ceramic head on the, on the stem implant, and that's what a total hip implant looks like. We'll get into more of the surgical options there at the end, kind of talking about new technologies and things. Non- um, uh, pharmaceutical treatments, meaning um, this is things outside of the realm of pills or medicines. Um, education, obviously, that's number one. We're here tonight kind of learning about this. Weight loss, we mentioned already, is a cause for osteoarthritis and a source of increased pain with uh, hip and knee arthritis and uh, can definitely benefit that. Uh, or the loss of progression of cartilage on the end of the bone. Physical therapy, keeping that range of motion or movement in the hip or knee. Exercises also help strengthen the muscles because over time, uh, I have a lot of patients ask me, well, the pain's not so much an issue, it's just that I can't move it. And over time, the stiffness can set into that knee. And with a hip replacement surgery, if you wait a long time, the muscles and tendons and ligaments over the uh, hip and knee replacement can atrophy and stiffen with time. And I don't do anything with those at the time of surgery. So after the surgery, those take time to rehabilitate and strengthen. Um, and so gait patterns and walking patterns and strengthen those muscles can take some time, even though the arthritic pain and the movements taken away from that bony block, the muscles, ligaments, and tendons take time to kind of heal because it's been so many years of being stiff and contracted down. They just didn't have to do all that motion before because they weren't able to do it because of the bony block from the spurs or the pain lemming from the hip and knee. 
aquatics is a, uh, one that I use quite frequently. Uh, swimming and aerobics in the, the pool environment, it uh, provides a lot of, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very low impact activity. The exercises that I recommend are cycling, spinning, uh, stationary bike, uh, swimming, elliptical, those type lower impact activities for cardio and that type of thing can relieve a lot of stress and uh, joint pressures and things. Aquatic therapy allows uh, for a lot of buoyancy in the water to allow reduce that weight or that uh, uh, pressure on the hip and knee itself. Obviously it, it comes back when you get out of that pool but it's one of those things where in the hip or in the pool itself it, it provides more of a pain, uh, not pain free but a pain less I guess environment so to speak to carry on those activities of exercises. Um, there's also assisted devices, obviously the cane, crutch, walkers, um, those types of things to unleave or unload the pressure on the joint itself. Um, orthotic devices, uh, braces, uh, we use uh, frequently in the knee. Uh, like I said, in the knee there can be three compartments and your wear pattern can be on the outside or inside of that knee and the braces will try to unload that to the other compartment to relieve the pressure on one side versus the other. Orthotic wedges in the shoe also have similar effect to try to unload or reorientate uh, or rotate your tires, so to speak, to kind of unload those pressures uh, in the hip or the knee. Again, these are some pictures. This is kind of a knee sleeve that I use, and I have a lot of patients say, well, I have a knee sleeve, and I picked it up at the pharmacy or whatever. But there's more unloader-type braces that are prescription um, uh, from a, a, like an orthopedic surgeon or a physician that would prescribe this specifically to the arthritic that they see on x-ray. This is just a pit pool um, picture there, and these are some more of the pictures of the braces. Um, these are just assistive devices that kind of help ease with elevated toilet seats and those types of things to make it easier to get up and down after, uh, with arthritis. Um, this are going to the medicine treatments. Um, talking about anti-inflammatories, these are the NSAIDs. Um, that's the Mobic, Motrin. Um, the prescription strength is Mobic and Slalabrex. Um, ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, Naproxen, those types of medicines, Diclofenac. Analgetics are more of the pain medicines. We talk about acetaminophen or Tylenol up here. Um, these are just more getting at the pain. The anti-inflammatory ones um, are the ones that have the biggest effect on um, pain management of arthritis because arthritis is basically inflammation and getting an anti-inflammatory to kind of help calm that down is the best relief. And I think we go through these individually. The analgesics is Tylenol. Altram is a prescription. The narcotics are the next step. Obviously, we try to avoid those at all costs um, because they can have addictive properties in the long term. Anti-inflammatory medicines, these are just a few. Um, again, these are cautionary. I don't, um, if you get into the long-term use at high doses of these, these can cause some ulcers. And also kidney functions that have to be followed monetary, you know, long-term, and that's usually done with your primary care physicians. Cortisone injections, is, there's different types of injections into the hip and knee. Um, cortisone injection is the biggest anti-inflammatory medicine there is, and we do this with a local injection locally within the hip and knee joint itself. Um, there's also, we add some numbing medicine in there as well, um, and this is done in the office. It's, it's, it's quite, uh, the bigger the joint, uh, and we, we're not getting, it, the knee is one of the biggest joints in the body, and obviously we're um, putting a needle into the knee. Um, it takes all about five, ten seconds to push the medicine itself. We do it with a, a cool spray. And out of all the injections I do, I, pro I would say the knee injection is probably the most benign out of all of them. Um, we can limit them to about three to four months. Um, every three to four months from a dosage standpoint, a lot of times patients ask me, well, does this cause any more damage into the knee or anything like that? Well, typically when we're doing cortisone injections to relieve pain in an arthritic joint, the cartilage is already gone, so the damage is already done. So we're doing this more of a pain relief um, and benefit to the knee. Um, and how long, and then another question I get is how long do these last? Well, that's the magic question. I don't have the answer to that. Everybody's different with that. The more severe the arthritic form, obviously the less effective these injections become. Usually the more n the numbers of these as they increase, they become less in duration as well. Usually the first ones are usually the, the longer lasting of the two. Um, cortisone injections, though, however, are probably the most potent in uh, decreasing inflammation and pain in um, these injections, and it can range... 
I have patients that come in every six months or a year and get an injection and do quite well with it. Other people, the pain tolerances and things are different and how they re re react to them are di completely different. So it's kind of a case by case uh, basis. There are also these lubricating injections that I wanted to talk about. There's several different brands. Uflex is another one that's not up there. Supart, Synvisc, and Hyaluron. Um, these are lubricating type injections. Um, Again, um, these are not building cartilage on the end of the bone. They're not slowing progression of cartilage on the end of the bone. Um, these are just helping with inflammatory markers within the knee joint itself, putting a kind of a better uh, concentrate of uh, synovial fluid as the motor oil, so to speak, of the hip and knee joint. And this is putting a, a better concentration of uh, fluid back in the knee, help with the inflammation that ultimately helps with the pain. Um, again, these can be longer lack lasting. Uh, typically these are not as um, a complete relieving of pain, but they can take a significant edge off where maybe supplementary anti-inflammatory medicines or the other things can kind of help relieve the pain. Again, these are coverage based from insurance companies. Usually typically every six months is when we can do these injections. Um, each brand is a different series of injections. Two parts here can be a series of three to five injections, one a week, a uh, week apart. Synvisc has now come out, well, it's been out for some time now. Synvisc one, which is one injection. Um, there's also, and these are kind of uh, uh, rooster comb based uh, cartilage uh, where these are come from. There's Uflexa, which is biologically engineered as well. Um, so there's a lot of different multiple brands and usually what brand you get is basically what one the insurance covers um, is the bottom line to that and that's kind of the conversation there. But uh, glucosamine chondroitin is another um, uh, kind of a supplement out there and there's the dosages there. Um, again, does this build cartilage? No. Um, does this prevent the loss of cartilage? No. Um, so none of these things that I've already mentioned, uh, medicines, injections, now glucosamine chondroitin, none of this is getting at, is the cartilage stopping the progression or building uh, or lo losing the wear of it? These are all helping with pain. That's the bottom line. And um, if, uh, if they help, they help. If they don't, they don't. And it's one of those things with glucosamine chondroitin, it's something I've, I've asked, is this going to be beneficial to me? Is this going to help me? I, I basically say this helps, again, with the anti-inflammatory effects of the knee or hip. Everybody's a little different. My experience with this with patients is that you need to be on it for about you know, a good two to three weeks to kind of tell the difference. And usually patients' difference is not they're coming to me and saying, oh, this is great, this is wonderful, all my pain is gone. That's not the experience. It's more of, well, then they ask me, well, I don't think it's doing anything. Well, then I say, well, then get off of it for a week or two and then, t you know, tell me if it's doing anything. And then that's where the people see, I think, the biggest difference is, well, when they go off of it, yeah, that's doing more than what I thought it was going to do, what it was doing because they're in a lot more pain when they go off of it. And that's truly how to kind of tell. It's not that when you take the medicine, it's, uh, all the pain uh, goes away. Joint replacement surgery, this slide just says I'm going to be busy for a long, long time. Um, 2005, 285,000 total hip replacements. Um, that's double, I think, or close to double, 523,000 uh, knee replacements were performed. That's in 05. In uh, 2030, um, these procedures are um, estimated there. You can kind of see a uh, jump in their numbers and how many procedures are done and the number of revision the surgeries the, um, uh, from the primary surgeries are skyrocketing. So these are all going up exponentially in time. So this is not going down, this is just going up on a graph. We'll get into some of the thoughts of surgery and um, some of the technologies and things out there and we'll kind of, kind of, some of these preconceptions a lot of times, I mean surgery is kind of a scary thought. Um, so we'll just kind of go into some of these and kind of, you know, talk a out a little bit and leave questions at the end for a lot of this. Again, I say this a lot to my patients. I mean, you know, once we do surgery, there's no turning back. And then that's kind of the theme. You know, it's one of those things where that's why we try these injections, medicines, and things. But when the medicines and the injections aren't doing it or not controlling the pain and the quality of life and you're not able to do the things, then that's when we talk about, you know, that next step and what that next step means and where it, you know, kind of goes. And we'll talk about the options in surgery. But once we talk surgery, there's really, you know, a lot of these uh, hip and knee replacements, I'm removing bone, putting metal in, you know, piece of plastic, and there's some life expenses to expect from these. And, you know, if, you know, there's a, 
we're changing the anatomy. It's not like we're not going, you know, and all these other things, we haven't done that yet. So they're all worth a try from an insurance standpoint, from a, a, re, a conservative treatment standpoint, all worth a try prior to talking about uh, a surgery that's going to change uh, you one way or the other. Let's see here. Lots of different options. We're going to kind of go through m primarily uh, partial knee, total knee, uh, and hip replacement surgeries um, and what's out there. Arthroscopy surgery is probably the most um, less invasive surgery out there. We do a lot of hip and knee arthroscopy um, in the hip and knee. Um, it's two fairly so, um, small poke holes, about a, a centimeter a piece. Um, outpatient surgery for a lot of it. Hip arthroscopy, we usually maybe stay over uh, 23 hours, so to speak. And um, this is for, you know, we talked about cartilage rings and tears and things like that. We can go in and remove that, trim things out, um, repair them. Um, but the cartilage at the end, on the end of the bone, that's the goal. That's what I was talking about before. And if that's worn, hip arthroscopy, knee arthroscopy, there's no surgery to put cartilage back on the end of the bone. Again, that's a theme running through this. No medicines is putting cartilage back on the end of the bone. Once you've worn it, it's gone. Um, there's no surgery to put cartilage back on the end of the bone um, when the tire tread is completely worn. Um, there are some, surgery, um, some specific surgeries in younger patients where we maybe do isolated lesions in the cartilage where we can go and put cells back there to regrow a hyaline cartilage, not their native uh, cartilage, but to fill that hole. But it's one of those things where I kind of talk about the surface. If your whole tire tread's worn out, the whole, the whole thing needs to be replaced. If it's a puncture in the and the uh, tire, we can go in and patch up that hole, but uh, typically if the whole tire tread's worn, we can't put the cartilage back on that whole surface. So arthroscopy surgery is very, uh, not necessarily a great surgery if you have uh, osteoarthritis in the hip, because obviously at the end of the day, that's where the pain's coming from, and we, don't, we can't put cartilage back on the end of the bone, so this is kind of proven to be kind of a 50-50 surgery. If, it depends if it's more meniscal or cartilage tear related versus you know osteoarthritic related osteotomy this is where it's a terminology that we use actually where we i said we have deformities in the bone and that we can be born with and um, sometimes we can go in early enough before the cartilage is worn again make cuts in the bone and realign the bone to make it straighter so basically rotating the tires so to speak to prevent that tire tread loss of the cartilage on the end of the bone these surgeries are done at a, usually at a earlier ages when the cartilage is pristine to prevent the loss of that cartilage loss over time, not when there's arthritis um, already there. Um, partial knee replacement, we'll get into some of this as well, but again on that x-ray, that one where that space was bone on bone on the inside and it was a good space on the outside, we can do partial knee replacements where we resurface just the inside portion of the knee versus the whole knee, uh, the whole knee itself. Total knee replacement was that picture where all three compartments are um, resurfaced. Um, hip resurfacing versus total hip replacement. A lot of terminologies here, but we'll have some pictures where the hip resurfacing, there's a, um, where we're recapping the end of the bone with a piece of metal. In the cup, we put a cup. And in the total hip replacement, we're removing that bone and putting a stem down with a ball in a cup. And we'll kind of talk about the differences um, before we're done here through the night. So I'll keep moving. Um, good reasons, or these are not good reasons to have your hip replacement uh, done. Um, my family thinks I should have it done. My friends say I should have it done. My surgeon thinks I should have it done. Um, basically, it gets at uh, what are you feeling and what are your pains and your, your, you know, your pain level and your quality of life. Um, it's basically that's the question, and that's what I ultimately I have. I just had a patient this afternoon <laughs> come in. Um, with all his daughters there, and, and they're all, he's like, I'm here because of them, you know, and I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> let's, hit, let's just sit, have you and me have a conversation here a minute, and then we'll see what they think, and because uh, their opinion matters as well, but um, we'll kind of get back to how, w what is your pain and what is your limitation, and, and kind of get at that, so, um, again, I'm miserable because of the pain, I'm not doing the things that I once enjoyed, I'm, you know, I have a lot of patients that even come to me, it's not so much the pain, it's just that, you know, I, you know and I'm, okay, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Well, find out they're not doing things that, because of the pain. They're, they used to walk so many miles every night, or they used to do this, and now they're not doing this because of the pain and avoiding things. Well, that's why they're not having the pain, but if they were doing things, they would. And so everybody has a little, it's amazing how people will say, oh, I don't have pain. I don't have pain. Okay, that's fine. But I mean, it's one of the, Everybody likes to be a stoic, I think, a lot of times, and it's one of those things, well, what does that actually mean? You're not doing what you used 
used to do and your health can deteriorate from that. And so that's a conversation as well. So this is a total knee replacement x-ray right here, the cap of the metal on the end of the bone. Again, this is not air, that's that piece of plastic now. That's not the cartilage, that's the space in between the thigh bone and shin bone. Thigh bone and shin bone is capped, cemented in with a piece of pla or a metal here on the end of the thigh bone and shin bone with that piece of plastic in between. So again, this is changing the anatomy, straightening the, the, the knee that once was bow-legged before, most likely the arthritis was in the inside here, and uh, putting that prosthesis in, straightening out that limb. Uh, helping with the range of motion, taking those spurs away, and obviously helping with the pain from hip re or knee replacement. Um, uh, this is a little bit more on uh, kind of what's changed out there a little bit. So you hear a lot about gender implants, knee implants, custom implants, um, partial implants, uh, a lot of uh, marketing out there. There's it's unbelievable. We never had uh, commercials on uh, orthopedic implants, but I think it's one of the biggest commercials out there, whether it's the lawyers talking about the recalls at night or um, you know, the, the, the makers of the products um, you know, selling their product and making all kinds of claims out there. And, so, and you don't really hear any of the surgeons out there making you know, the data and the scientific analogy, and that's probably why we're a little bit here. This is Kind of the old technique, I, I say that, but this is it's still pretty much probably the standard out there. Um, we use a lot of these instruments here. It's carpentry work, basically, and this is, these aren't real bones. These are saw bones that we kind of use as uh, we make these, and, and basically this is kind of just showing kind of what we're doing to the end of the bone. We're reshaping and you know, cutting them specifically to fit these implants on them with all these jigs and tools and rods and saws and, you know, it's carpenter work basically at the end of the day. And, and we're kind of matching that at the end of the, you know, uh, end of the bone. And you can see, you know, the tools and instruments kind of used in a knee replacement surgery. And those are just pictures of, you know, ones that, you know, that we use in just, um, yeah, yeah, those are the actual instruments or just the models of them. Um, we've kind of gone to now where at the time of surgery I kind of get the shape and the size of the bone based off of those tools that I use to you know, got, you know, look at the size and shape. Now we're using a lot more technology advances in MRI imaging or CT imaging where we're actually getting the morphology and the size specific to your knee before me ever even making a, you know, a cut or looking in the knee to kind of see the size of your knee or anything like that. So I'm able to template and get in a identical size and shape of your knee of the end of the thigh bone, of the end of the, uh, the tibia, basically a mapping of the end of your bone based off these MRIs. And then the companies will actually give me models of the shapes of the end of the bones with these cutting guides and jigs that I can actually fit onto the end of the bone to actually match your anatomy specifically and giving you that um, specific uh, uniform shape and um, type to the knee. And this is actually one company's um, imagery here of the end of the bone or the model. And these are kind of the cutting gig jigs that we are used to fit onto the end of the bone. And so I know a lot more of prior to surgery um, about the size and shape and fit, and I can change that based on the algorithms on the MRI all sitting at a computer before I even you know, get into the operating room. So this takes a lot of the, you know, my head stuff that I'm doing in the surgery out of it and takes it a lot out into the, onto the computer, me ahead of time doing some of this, opposed, and then when I'm in there, still doing the cut and precision cuts and things like that to the knee, but we're using these instrumentations based off of different alignments, not me just kind of eyeballing it and things like that. And that's kind of the, the custom knee implant. I, I mean, most all companies are basically out there. I'll talk, I mean, there's the top five orthopedic implant companies, Stryker, uh, Smith & Nephew, Biomet, Depew. Um, I don't know who I missed there. That's Zimmer. Um, they're all the top five co orthopedic companies in the United States. Um, they all have a custom knee um, implant technology based off MRI or CT. Um, so they're all out there. Um, Basically, um, the claims out there yet to really show improvement, I think they get the alignment over time, be correctly, it hasn't been shown to be that significant in a high volume surgeon's hands to show that much improvement. It may help community surgeons who don't do a lot of joint replacements, it may help them get that accuracy over time. Um, shortens the length of surgery, hard to say there a little bit, again, this is not really Affecting the approach, this is how maybe affecting the alignment and longevity of the prosthesis over time may help uh, decrease blood loss over time because we're uh, not having to drill these holes for these guides as much, so there may be less blood loss overall, and it does um, improve the accuracy over time. 
gender knees. Um, again, uh, you know, th these, are, uh, these slides are specific. I mean, I think it's Zimmer that came up with the gender knee. There's all these different in implant. There's a 30-year knee. There's the round and the oval knee. And, you know, you have all the marketing out there that each company comes with a marketing ad that kind of claims right to their knee. And um, basically, the female anatomy is different than male anatomy, and there are smaller and narrower. And so that's some um, implants take that into consideration. Um, based off the size and the implant of the knee. So it's, these are kind of the things that the morphology, um, different companies uh, have different, um, I guess, interest in their systems that they have for knee implants. Partial knee replacement here. Um, again, three compartments in the knee, inside, outside, and under this kneecap here. Um, partial knee is just doing a surface of the inside portion of the thigh bone, inside portion of the uh, shin bone with a piece of plastic in between. ACL and PCL ligaments are intact, um, where in the total knee we do usually sacrifice one of those. Um, so it's a more natural maybe feeling knee, less incision, quicker recovery, um, because there's just, a, you know, it's kind of the, I think I have, uh, it's kind of the boat in the bottle trick. You can kind of see here on x-ray how this person has that medial arthritis again, bone on bone on the inside, space on the outside. This is a partial knee implant. Afterwards, this is a total knee implant, and you can see the difference in how much bone preservation that we're having here from the, the bony anatomy. Um, again, those are the things that I touted already, less invasive, less um, uh, smaller incision. That's because the parts and pieces are just a third of the sizes of a total. Less bone loss, more natural feeling knee, and usually it's overnight in the hospital and go home the next day, where t typical knee replacements usually two nights in the hospital and, and go home the third day type of thing. Um, recovery after knee replacement, there is just said at hospital stays two to three days. Um, for this is for a, a, a full a total knee replacement. Um, everybody's different with this as well. Um, the anatomy in the knee um, has not changed, uh, well the anatomy in the knee hasn't changed in a long time, but um, it's the anatomy, uh, the windows in which to get into the knee is basically through the front. And um, there's ligaments on either side, there's an arteries and nerves to the leg that go in the back. And so the approach, where I'm talking about is incisions, where in the hip we have a lot of different approaches to hip replacement surgery. And that's because there's a lot of different windows in which to do carpenter work and total hip replacement. In knee replacement surgery, um, the window is basically through the front. Now there's modifications, making incisions a little smaller, um, cutting less muscle and doing these types of things. But overall, that incision is still straight down on the front of the knee. Um, where we haven't done, you know, drastic changes just because of the anatomy surrounding the knee itself. Um, but basically, um, to recover, recovery process for total knee replacements, I say basically is four to six weeks. Now, what does that mean? That's four to six, two weeks. It's, it, knee replacements, are, recoveries are different than hip replacement patients as well. I would say that in general. Um, Two weeks, you don't really like me for a whole lot. Um, you know, we put an incision on your knee, and, and you have to have therapy after knee replacement because of getting the motion back in the knee uh, to get that range of motion, that bend and straightening. And we put an incision here, and then I tell you you have to move it because then it can get stiff on you because scar tissue can form. And so that's why therapy and knee replacement is so very important because... I, you know, doing total knee replacement helps your pain in the knee, but then you can get stiffness because scar tissue forms because patients don't want to move it because it's tender or sore, they can get stiff. And then uh, stiff knee, nobody likes that either. So it's one of the, you, you know, that's why therapy is very important for a four to six week period after uh, knee replacement surgery. But generally permitted to play golf, uh, walk, swim, bike, dance, all those types of things. Um, there's some certain activities, high impact activities that I try to avoid for the long term, and we can talk about those. But um, that's basically recovery after total knee replacement. We can talk about more specifics of that um, for the sake of time. I'm going to keep motor in here. Um, hip replacement surgery, that's an image or x ray of a hip replacement. Again, we make that bone cut. Um, this is a stem that actually in my fellowship, this is a, um, my, the surgeons that I worked with, he was a designer of this stem, tried and true. This is the press fit stem that. Uh, no longer used required cement for hip replacement surgery, which kind of revolutionized hip replacement surgery in the United States. We use a lot smaller stems where they're approximately coated, where the bone grows in up here more towards the top. You obviously see the socket, this ball here, and then you have a liner. So four parts and pieces to a hip replacement, the stem, cut, ball, socket. Um, minimally invasive, less mini incision, hip replacement. I don't know, lasers I hear a lot, but... You know, it's one of these things where you can see this. There's, no, there's not a boat 
Yeah, I, yeah, the boat and the bottle trick. They're, these implants are physically they're large. Um, you know, knee replacements can be the size of your fist. Um, you know, and you can't put a size of a fist into an incision like that. That doesn't exist. It, it, nowhere. I don't know who tells you or markets or whatever they say on the internet or tell you that you can't do it. It physically cannot be done. Um, you know, those boat and the bottle tricks, yeah, they can expand, and I saw all kind of neat tricks for this, but this is metal, so that does not do that. And so um, we do not have that out there yet. Um, it's not, I don't even think it's around the corner, but um, we are making our incisions smaller. Um, we are not being as uh, where they weren't once before. We um, have been putting them in in smaller incisions, but there is still a finite size to how big the incision has to be. And typically I say sometimes it's to the size gene you are is the size incision you get. That's not always the, truly the case in um, an anterior total hip replacement. I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, this is talking about bearing surfaces, and I don't care if we're probably missing probably 10 commercials on the TV right now about it, about metal-on-metal metal hip replacements and their recalls. Um, the lawyers love this one. Um, but there's different bearing surfaces, and what does that mean? Well, all hip replacements have metal in them. I said there's four parts and pieces to a hip implant. The stem's made of titanium, the cup's made of titanium, and then there's a ball and a liner, and that's your brake pad and your tire tread. That's what the bearing surface is, and there's m multiple different combinations of that. You can have a metal ball with a plastic liner. You can have a metal ball with a metal liner. You can have a ceramic ball with a plastic liner. You can have a ceramic ball with a ceramic liner, all these different combinations. And basically what metal on metal hip replacements are is when there's a metal ball rubbing against a metal liner. Um, that's what a metal on metal hip replacement is when the bearing surfaces are both made out of metal. Hip resurfacing, we've got a lot of you know, press out there too. Hip resurfacing, that's that cap on the end of the bone, different than total hip replacement, just kind of a little bit different terminology, different procedure, but hip resurfacing is basically metal rubbing against a metal liner. So that is a metal and metal implant. Um, and hip resurfacing is basically, I've gone 2009 and hit its kind of peak and it's, it's kind of fallen in use uh, since that time. Um, very small indications for this surgery anymore, and we'll kind of get into a little bit of the reasons why. One of them is this right up here, at least in my hands. I used to do some hip resurfacing. I, I basically I don't do a lot of hip resurfacing anymore, um, and mostly is because of this. Anterior total hip replacement is uh, a surgery that I do quite a few of these. We average about eight to ten a, a week here. I do about four or five of these a day on Mondays and Wednesdays. Um, anterior total hip replacement. Um, this is, this is talking about the approach now. The carpentry work is all basically the same, cutting the bone, putting the stem ball cup, all that is very much the same. Uh, any orthopedic surgeon who does hip replacement surgery is going to do that carpentry work that I just mentioned. Now, not all uh, hip replacement surgeons do, do, does anterior total hip replacement, and that's talking about the approach, where we make the incision. Anterior total hip replacement, we make the incision kind of more in the front versus the side or the back. Uh, the side and the back is traditional hip replacement where they cut the biggest muscles in your body, the glute muscles. Um, afterwards, we have to repair those. Um, and with the front approach, the anatomy is more band-like. And I can go through a natural tissue plane, kind of part them like a curtain. When I'm all done, the curtain can fall back, and we basically suture up the skin, not cutting or detaching the muscle. Translates to a lot less pain, a lot quicker recovery in patients with anterior total hip replacement. And also, I would say there's less chance of dislocation or popping in and out of socket. So there's no precautions after anterior total hip replacement, meaning you don't have to cross your legs or bend. You can't bend for a period of time, usually, which are all restricted on you with traditional or total hip replacement through the posterior approach or lateral approaches. Um, most of my patients, I did uh, four of these yesterday. They all, I think all left. I don't know at what time today, but... They're all out of here after their therapy session at 1 o'clock this afternoon. Um, usually your stays, I would say, for the vast majority of my patients are overnight, go home the next day, um, putting as much weight on as you can tolerate um, with no real restrictions in movement. Traditional hip, and some of the reasons we'll get at to why here, traditional hip replacement, you don't, you actually, you're, the patient is laid on their side. Some of the um, reports out there, I do both hips at the same time. That's not just because I can do both hips at the same time. That's not a big sum feat. It's more of the table that has to do everything to do with it because traditional hip replacement, we lay you on your side, make an incision in through the buttock area, and we can't do both hips at the same time because the other one's laying on the, on the other side. And to flip you on the other side after we just did hip surgery on that, it doesn't make any sense. Well, anterior total hip replacement, I, have a surgery, I do the surgery while you're laying on your back. Um, and this looks like a torture device, but it's actually not. Um, <laughs> 
This way is a lot more torturous, trust me, than uh, laying on your back. We have you in boots and that, that uh, beam allows that leg to kind of freely move around in space where I can get into a smaller incision to make my window to kind of look around. But you're laying on your back and that's the reason why we can do both at the same time. Now everybody's not a candidate, I'm not saying that, but that's the reason there because I can have access to both. I can do one hip and then we just move the other side and do the other side while you're laying flat on your back. Again, a little history of anterior approach. It's actually, people ask me, is this new, something new? Or, you know, when I first came to Western Michigan and started doing this, I was probably one of the first in the area doing it. I swear I was from out of space doing some of this and where I was from and, you know, what is this? And it's been around for a long time. Actually, it's been in Europe for a long, long time. We used to do this approach a lot in children's uh, surgery or hip surgery. Um, actually, Joel Mata in 2002, Santa Monica, um, did some of my training out there, like I said, in uh, Cedar sinai and that's where I kind of got my taste of it a little bit. Um, he developed that table that I just uh, mentioned and made it a lot more uh, ease of use to help surgeons kind of do this surgery. Um, you can see that there's more and more, this is an old slide, there's probably more surgeons than 200, but it was a, a small group of surgeons starting to do this, and there's a lot more of them starting to do this. I would say there's more say they do it than they actually do it, but um, that, that's coming, uh, becoming a larger and larger number. A lot of questions I get asked too is why don't more surgeons do this surgery? It just makes more sense. You're not cutting muscle, you know, why aren't they doing it? Well, the surgery is not something that you can learn overnight. You can't go into a weekend course and get your training and be done. And teaching an old dog new tricks in orthopedics is very true. So older surgeons out there have been doing this 20 years, it works for them, you know, we're gonna keep on the same way. And so I'm probably a little bit younger of a surgeon, like I said, and uh, been trained in this and kind of, so as the generations change in surgeons, I think this is gonna become more and more of an option. Obviously, I said in the East Coast and West Coast is very, very common uh, surgery. Um, uh, benefits, I kind of said less trauma to the body, smaller incisions, um, less pain, faster recovery, and I have some slides at this, kind of talk about this, fewer restrictions of, of activity afterwards, and uh, very less, m less pain medicine needed after the surgery as well, um, and minimal physical therapy or rehab needed because we're not cutting the muscle afterwards. Um, downsides, um, relatively new procedure, I don't know, this is, I think this is kind of being proven in itself, every new procedure out there. It's not that new, I just kind of said that to you. It's been around for some time and, it, and it's here to stay. Um, unlike a lot of the different surgeries that are you know, kind of come and go, this has been around for some time. There can be a little bit of numbness in the front of the thigh. Not to say that there can't be numbness and incision in the back, but it's a little bit more noticeable in the front, and that's, one of, that's a little bit of a difference. I wouldn't really necessarily say a downside because they all have risk to surgery. Um, Comprehensive uh, recovery programs, these are educational exercises that are done before. We have a booklet, if you come to my office and are going to surgery, we have a booklet, classes. Christy Dennett, who's the head of the joint replacement program here, um, does a lot of the educational uh, pieces for that. Um, we also do a lot of multimodal, different anesthesia type of things where I'm doing injections at around uh, the incision at the time of surgery, doing these under spinal anesthesia with just some uh, sleeping medicine through the IV, not general anesthetics where you're completely out. So recovery times are a lot more rapid with the different multimodal, meaning a lot of different things that we're addressing pain-wise after hip replacement or knee replacement surgery. Um, again, we're talking about these are generalities, and I'm going to get more to this at the end, but this is kind of like when people are weaning off a walker less than 24 hours, a cane, people are going, you know, a lot of people are going home with just a cane, weaning from in an anterior total hip replacement, I would say that's a matter of a week of staying around, um, and then going away, driving, people are driving at one to two weeks in hip, the anterior total hip replacements. These are probably getting at more of, uh, you know, knee replacement patients and things like that, return to work. Um, I think, I guess that says works, but it's supposed to be weeks, but three to six weeks, everybody's different with that. I have people in office jobs returning to work in a week or two after anterior total hip replacement. I, I hear all kinds of crazy stuff, so we won't get into that, but I have people heli skiing, all doing all kinds of, all kinds of stuff after uh, hip and knee replacement surgeries. This is uh, old information here, so I'm going to move to the end. Um, these are um, some of the stay, uh, links of stay discharge. I would say that's generally speaking is still up there, probably up over 94% are discharged home. 
uh, and the SNF is meaning a re rehab facility is only 6%. I think this is even increasing more. We're having more and more patients going home and having um, therapists go to their house maybe for a week or two. Um, hospital stay, length of stays, average of stays is one to five. This is all for hip and knee patients. Like I said, I said majority of my patients with hip uh, surgery are staying overnight and going home the next day. These are kind of functional outcomes. These are some older data. I think we have some new uh, data in here. Um, these are talking about kind of infection rates, um, dislocation rates in my practice. These are talking about um, the last, I don't know, over 600 uh, patients of mine. Um, this is reduction in loss of uh, dislocation risk of uh, after hip replacement surgery. And anterior total hip replacement, very rare to occur. That's why you don't have those precautions. I don't have um, any patients of mine that have had a dislocation through the front approach. Part of that's the table, part of me checking that at the time of surgery. There's a lot of added advantages of that as well. These are Womax scores, just meaning uh, we don't have to get into this too specifically, but this is talking about asking patients. We collect data in all my office. We have iPads and do these questionnaires in all my patients and collect this and see this to national averages. And this is you can see here, my patients are in red, the database. This is actually from Marshall Steel databases. So this is a national average. These databases are from top orthopedic practicing hospitals in the country. And this is my data here in red. These are people saying that they're reporting basically no uh, pain with walking on flat surfaces at two weeks after surgery, six weeks, three months. And you can kind of see how that's kind of elevated here. And this is after uh, replacement at other leading orthopedic uh, hospitals that we com uh, compare our data with across the country. Again, this is up going up and down stairs. The reds, the bone and joint centers, the database is basically not the national average. This is higher than the national average. These are basically competing orthopedic uh, hospitals across the country. Again, this is difficulty, say, patients reporting no pain ascending or descending stairs at these intervals after the, um, uh, surgery. This is hip and knee re um, patients, so th there may be a little bit of difference between hip and knee replacements. Again, this is kind of talking about basically what I summarized in those graphs. This is transfusion rates, meaning blood loss after the time of surgery, who needed a transfusion. Um, these are, again, uh, very competing uh, orthopedic practices across the, for hip and knee patients here. And this are numbers here, probably less than 8% uh, chance of needing a transfusion after uh, hip or knee replacement surgery, probably even less than uh, knee replacement surgery. Again, Tom Watson had the anterior total hip replacement competing quite well. Uh, Holland Hospital, um, actually one of the reasons why I continue to practice here is this uh, dedicated team. Uh, it's uh, dedicated to the uh, joint care here as of, uh, I think, uh, it's, it's next week, isn't it? Uh, next weekend, uh, there's going to be an open house. Two floors above us is the brand new uh, 24 private suite beds uh, dedicated to orthopedic or uh, joint replacement patients. Um, the public is welcome on the 17th, I believe, on Saturday. What's the times on that? 10 to 2. Um, but that will, the first patient, and actually this is an old picture. Or did you update that? You did, nice. I didn't realize that, but this is the new floor right there. Uh, my old picture didn't have that floor existing, but now it exists, and it's the two floors right above us. Um, and it will be opened for the first patients on the 19th of August. But then Christy Dennis information is there. She's the joint coordinator back in the room there. And that's her number there. But I think that is it. I think I have some time for questions. I tried to rush to that. Isn't it? Um, for treatment, uh, so the cortisone injections we do for hip and knee replacements, or hip and knee osteoarthritis. So the question is uh, basically the timing of cortisone injections at around the time of knee arthritis or hip arthritis. Um, we do injections fairly more frequently in knee patients for arthritis than hip, so I'm just kind of talking there a little bit. But um, it all depends. You're right. So it all depends. If somebody comes into my office, never had an x-ray before, hey, doc, I have knee pain, get an x-ray, and it's horrible arthritis, bone on bone, you know, no space there left at all. I mean, usually for the first time, had no treatment, usually I suggest, yeah, maybe it's worth one injection because we don't know how long it's going to last. Maybe this lasts you six months. Maybe it lasts you a year. Maybe it doesn't last you at all. Or even if it, meaning at all, I mean maybe a week or two where it doesn't, you know, get you much duration. But um, I can kind of help guide that and predict that case by case basis. But it's one of those things where usually, if it's the first time coming in, depends on the form of arthritis, how you know moderate to severe it is, and how that I can kind of guesstimate, so to speak, on how it's going to help patients because everybody's different. And you know, usually if it's never been tried before, I think it's at least worth an initial attempt um, before major surgery. Now, sometimes 
If the deformity is so bad, the stiffness is so bad, and the pain, you know, from in the X-rays point to that, then it, a simple injection is not going to correct a lot of those changes. But they can help with pain for a, a lot of patients. Um, I would say it would be at least worth an attempt before, like I said, cortisone injection, if it doesn't do anything, meaning lasting and helping pain for a period of time, we're not out a whole lot. There's not a lot of downside to that um, because the, the damage is already done. The cortisone is not necessarily, you know, making anything necessarily worse. Um, so there's not a lot of down risk to it where total hip replacement or knee replacement, there are risks to surgery. There's major, you know, there's risks to that. And so that's where I think it's uh, worthwhile. Did I ask your question? Do you have a second part to that? Well, yeah. yeah. Age. Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah. Usually the more you have, the less likely they are to last as long as typically the pattern, so to speak. And, you know, it's one of those things where if it's three to four months, I, you know, you can do them every three to four months. If it's only lasting in two, three weeks or a month or something like that, and then you're in pain the rest of the time until you can get another one, then it's one of those things where they become usually less effective. Um, but again, ultimately, if you're okay with the pain that you're experiencing between them, then it's not being okay with it. I guess it's more of, the, it's ultimately your decision on when you want to proceed with the surgery and kind of correct that overall. Mm -hmm. But there are the lubricating, which is another type of injection sometimes I have trial to. Good question, good question. So there's... Yep, um, so there's multiple bearing. Um, obviously, I talked about there's lots of different brands out there, and then all the different brands has all the different types of bearing options out there, and metal on metal is one, metal on plastics another, or polyethylene. There's ceramic on ceramic or ceramic on polyethylene. Um, in my practice, I use, I'll just, be, I'll just shoot it out there, I use 100% ceramic on polyethylene liner, and I use that on it whether you're 80 or you're 30 and need a hip replacement. Um, I think the technologies in the polyethylene or the plastic are uh, far superior than they have been in the past, and they have um, very limited downside. Now, the metal-on-metal -metal issues we didn't talk about can have, you can get a metal ions that can form from the wear properties of this metal rubbing against the metal. And there's been issues with your body of people getting hypersensitivities to this, and we can't predict who gets those hypersensitivities. And if that happens, your body mounts an immune response against the metal ions that are formed, and they can then deteriorate the muscles around the hip. And if that's to occur, we don't have a solution for that. So that's what is uh, not, the, uh, that's why I've gone away. I've not used any metal on metal in my practice. I, I, I don't plan to. I don't see myself doing it. I've gone away from hip resurfacing because of the metal on metal issues. I think a lot of people went to metal on metal issues because of, you know, thought that it was a, a superior bearing surface. I think the polyethylenes are proving them to be, you know, proving that wrong. Um, I also think uh, metal on metal bearing surfaces that people went to that because they could have bigger heads in them to uh, make the hip more stable, to, to have less dislocation problems. I said in my practice with anterior total hip replacement, that's pretty much a non-issue. So um, dislocations going through the front are very rare. Um, and so basically in my practice, um, I think posterior surgeon or traditional hip replacement still use some metal on metal because of the dislocation uh, risk. But in my practice, that's why I've gone away with it. I, you know, it's different for everybody. There isn't an anterior course to say, yeah, I'm certified in anterior total hip replacement. So you can't go into a search in the office and say, can I see your certificate on if you're anterior certified to do this procedure? Um, a surgeon who's board certified can basically choose to do what procedure he wants to do at any time. Now, whether how many he's done of them or how comfortable he's doing with, that's a completely different uh, scenario. I probably wouldn't, if it was me, I'm just, now I'm not talking as an orthopedic surgeon, I probably wouldn't want somebody that's, I'm in their first 50 or something like that. It's been kind of shown to, you know, be in the, you know, first 50 patients of him doing a new procedure he's never really done before. But we practice on cadavers and different things like that out there, and there's some bias to that. So in any hip and replacement, I'm not saying that most surgeons can't do this surgery, but again, I am fellowship trained, so I have my biases against high volume and doing a lot of these, and it's one of those things where you want to do somebody that does 30 a year or 500 a year, and that's just the difference there a little bit. Mm -hmm. There's multiple reasons for why hip replacements or knee replacements fail. Um, the question is uh, revision surgery rates and those types of things. Um, hip replacements fail for multiple different reasons. One's infection, probably the number one, you know, overall, and that's unpredictable, so to speak, based on that. Uh, again, I've had no deep infections in my practice, but again, that can change at any time. Um, 
parts and pieces can come loose over time. If you have multiple dislocations, you may need a revision for whatever reason or you know, differing position of the parts and pieces. So there's a lot of different re revision rates. Now, um, you know, you can have poor bone quality where the bone doesn't grow in or those types of things. So there's a lot of different causes or reasons for it. It's very hard to just give you a blanket statement, you know, on revision rates. But I would say overall, um, a lot of people ask me, likely to have having this the rest of your life or something like that. And that's taking all comers in, the wear of the plastic, parts and pieces coming loose, dislocation, in fact, all these different things. And it's one of those things where I'd say, generally speaking, it goes down a percent a year. Of, so I, I say it another way is 20 years from now, I'm 80% chance of having the hip or knee that I've had in, you know, 20 years ago. It goes down about a percent a year, taking all comers. Yeah. Hard to, I mean, it's very hard to answer one specific, yeah. Yep, and I, this is, gets a little bit off the track or off the, 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 the lecture portion. I'll, I'm free to say what I can say. And, um, and having said that, I'll, I'll, I'll basically say I'm a consultant uh, for Stryker. Um, I am a paid consultant for Stryker. I'm not paid um, for them for royalties of what implant that I use. So I don't get royalties off of what stem that I put in a patient. I get paid for teaching other surgeons the procedure that I do. Um, and I do go to, uh, it's basically more on approach and education that I do for Stryker. Um, Stryker, like I said, is one of the companies out there. But I don't get paid specifically by what implant that I use. So I want to make that clarity there because there are surgeons that are designers out there that do. And that may bias their choice of what implant that you use. My choice for that implant, um, I think they're the top five orthopedic implant companies, like I said, out there. Um, I think they all have similar kind of products. I use probably what I feel is the best out there, what I use myself or my parents, obviously. I'm not also limited by the hospital in what for cost. So I use in what basically for the most part, you know, I use what I use in my 80-year-olds and my 30-year-olds. I use basically the same implant. I'm not limited um, based on the quality or the type of implant. Um, generally speaking, I use a titanium stem or cup for the, you know, and then the ceramic on polyethylene for the hip. Um, the knee implant that I use, if you want the name, is a triathlon uh, striker implant. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I use different for partials. I'm sorry, I, I didn't mention that. I use a Biomet uh, partial implant. It's called the Oxford knee. Triathlon. triathlon is the total knee implant that I use with striker. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I use for my knee implant. I know them both, and um, you know it's one of those things where I, I've actually trained in. Um, so all the fellowships in the country have you know different fellowships, and there's Dr. Berger in Chicago, and I did a fellowship, and Dr. Berger has a fellowship in Chicago. I did my fellowship, like I said, in D.C. One of my attendings in my fellowship actually was trained by Dr. Berger and uh, used Zimmer and a lot of his knee uh, things there. So I'm well versed in Dr. Berth Berger's methodology and, and Zimmer and in Chicago, and I use a lot of those methodologies in my uh, surgery, and there's a, some that I take. I think I take some of the positives. There's also, I think, some negatives. I think there's pluses and minuses to all the surgeries out there and all the surgeons' experiences, and basically, I kind of use what I feel the best from all systems, because I trained with multiple different surgeons and got that taste and that experience. Talking specifically about names and practices and people in Grand Rapids, I probably won't comment on, but I think they all are, you know, they do a very good job. And I, but again, it's one of those things, nobody, I still think in Grand Rapids is not doing an anterior approach, or, and I stay very busy through West, most of the state with uh, the, the hip replacement surgery. You're talking specifically in knee. I don't think... Um, I don't think their data or their outcomes differ in how I, you know, they... I, Berger uses Zimmer, uh, last I knew, I, didn't, I don't know, but uh, the specific person that you're, I don't know if he uses Zimmer or not, but um, it's one of those things, outcomes-wise, I don't, uh, it, his methodology does not show any improvement. He's not totally opposed to not going straight down the knee. Well, Berger does go straight down the knee, he just uses a very, uh, he uses a smaller window where he tries to avoid minimal cutting, and in some people you have to cut, and I've seen, you know, in that surgery, I've done multiple tutors of that surgery, and basically I do the same thing, but some patients you just have to make a little uh, muscle cut. He, one thing that the claims of his is he, he does overnight surgery for knee replacement surgery and that kind of thing. I said that I, we have that. I could probably do outpatient surgery, hip replacement surgery. I could make that claim too, but it's one of those things where that just makes, means I have to surround myself with a lot of personnel to take a, a lot of calls, and he has a army, so to speak, of nurses that surround him that can manage all of that. And that's a, that's a totally different conversation than how he does surgery, than the management of patients after care. Mm -hmm.
Um, it's a standard. That's a stip, uh, skip protocol based, uh, standardized by the government um, or uh, through, the, through the country. Um, it's one of those things where you, you get a pre-op antibiotic and two doses afterwards, and this is just a prophylactic dose to prevent or ward off any... Oh, actually, that, that recommendation she, you're talking now, the question is why do you need uh, antibiotics before or after or before dental work, um, you know, after hip or knee replacement is the question. Correct. Yeah, that, that uh, recommendation as of the academy this past year has kind of gone to the wayside um, where it's not necessarily recommended. Um, we don't have any scientific proof to say that. The reason why before is bacteria in the any time with teeth cleaning or something like that can get in the bloodstream, bacteria in the bloodstream like metal, and you potentially can get an infection into the hip or knee. Um, that's the methodology there. There's no scientific really proof to say that that really necessarily occurs or we can find that. Um, and as, uh, Academy of Orthopedics basically in the last year has basically gone to the wayside to make that, it used to be for two years after hip and knee replacement, now it's uh, kind of gone to the wayside and not necessarily the recommendation. Um, you still may see surgeons do that or say that. Um, I think it's easy enough to take an antibiotic twice a year for a teeth cleaning or something like that or a procedure uh, to prevent something because if you get a hip infection or knee infection, that's a life-changing event. Um, and that's a life-changing event in a in the bad way um, in the sense of uh, a lot of times if it's bad enough, you'll have to take out the whole implant, uh, put an antibiotic spacer in for six weeks, be on IV antibiotics. Um, in that period of time and then re-implant if the bacteria is still not there. So you see the devastating side of it and you just see the antibiotic taking once before or after. You, you can kind of see how surgeons are weighed a little bit, dentists are weighed against it. <laughs> but the, the data from the dentist and the orthopedics uh, societies have basically said that's kind of gone to the wayside, mm -hmm. that recommendation. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, so yep, blood clots are one of the risk factors after hip and knee replacements. In my patient population, I use Xeralto, which is a newer medicine. Um, it's not the Lovenox, which is the belly sots. It's not the Coumadin, which needs the uh, blood monitoring. It's uh, Xeralto, which is a pill that you take once a day. For, for my knees, it's 14 days after surgery. For my hips, it's still 24. I may go away from that at some point because mobility is the key to preventing blood clots more than any pill or anything like that. And in my hip implant patients, um, you know, they're so much more active so much sooner that I think that could be lessened. But uh, still do that from a prophylactic. Because, again, getting a blood clot that can go to a pulmonary embolus to your lung that potentially could kill you, again, is a bad thing. So that's why we do that blood thinning medicine prophylactically for a period of time. Yeah. How much do I do a pain management? Um, before, yeah. Yeah, again, we kind of talk about everybody's specific. A lot of times we do those anti-inflammatory medicines. Again, everybody's different with it, their tolerations, allergies, um, whether or not they have issues of blood, bleeding and ulcers in the stomach and those types of things. Again, getting into narcotic pain medicine and, and, and those types of medicines, I do not prescribe a lot of narcotic medicines for pre-surgery you know, pre or something like that. Usually that is... Um, uh, already done by the primary care doctor or something like that, and we usually have those narcotic medicines prescribed by one uh, physician uh, managing the pain um, prior to surgery. So I don't get in a lot of that because that's usually a longer time period of um, time, um, you know, before they're talking about surgery. Now, if it's after surgery, obviously I do a lot of that um, prescribing. But in the um, beforehand or the treatment wise of it, it's usually done by a primary care physician in one office and not done by multiple uh, different physicians. Mm -hmm. Pretty nice out there, so I try to get through that as much as possible. All right.